Question 1. There are different views on Dharma. For example, some say Jataka is unreliable. It's just a story. Some say Jatakas are true. How do we distinguish between the true Dharma? My main concern is to establish right view and to see my deluded mind. I'm afraid that Studying the wrong Dharma will lead me against the path to Nibbana. Question 2. Dhammapada It seems that some verses of the Dhammapada are derived from Jataka tales. Is this fine to memorize? Is it fine to memorize the verses of Dhammapada? Thank you, Rombo. Well, we have to remember with uh, <coughs> the written word, uh, what we call the Pariyati Dhamma, the Tripitaka, we have uh, Suttas, Vinaya, the Abhidhamma. And we've inherited them for many, many generations, mostly of monastics, but lay people have helped as well to record them, improve them, remember them. But it's two and a half thousand years since the time of the Buddha. So I would say it's natural there'll be a little bit of variation, errors, something missed out, something put in by mistake, or deliberately but put in after. There's bound to be some of that. And the important thing is the majority of that information is it effective for helping you understand the way of practice out of suffering to Nibbana, the end of suffering. And I think in my background, the Thai forest tradition, the agreement is that it is still valid, useful, uh, effective um, method or technical manual, if you could say. <laughs> for getting out of suffering. However, one has to have a word of caution as well. That that's the written word. And we get out of suffering not through the written word. That's only the, the beginning of our practice. Listening, reading, contemplating what we've heard and listened to. And then we have to put it into practice and place practice in your heart. Your heart, your mind, day by day. Ajahn Chah used to say, you know, you can read the word anger, and that's one thing. Or in another language, what's the word for anger in Hokkien? Kio. 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 Doesn't sound anything like anger. These words, you know, every language has a word for anger, but anger as an experience in your heart, that's different, isn't it? And someone practicing may not even need words to know that. You just know with a feeling, don't you? When you're upset, angry, you'll get a feeling bubbling up from here. It's extreme anger and flares out in all directions, doesn't it? And it leads you to do things, physically do things, mentally a lot of mental, what we call mental proliferation very fast thoughts are triggered, reactions. All of that can be known. You don't have to describe it or give words to it. Just know it as an experience and know that it's suffering and know that there must be something better than when you're angry. And that is when you're not angry. Non-anger is better than anger. So the Buddha encouraged us to cultivate non-anger or kindness, compassion, to help us abandon anger. That's going on in your heart, in your experience. So the words help, 
while they're directing to experience, get directing us to practice. And that's why my teachers like me keep saying, develop the mindfulness, the quality of knowing. Because that's the number one support for knowing your own mind, your own heart, what's going on. You have to pay attention, you have to be mindful, you have to be aware. So all the pariyati, there's always the possibility that something can be misunderstood, misinterpreted, misrecorded. But if generally it's according to his, um, what the Buddha has taught and also what teachers over the centuries have <coughs> practiced and realized for themselves, and they say, yeah, these teachings of the Buddha, generally what you read in the Tripitaka is true and effective way of practice. Well, maybe that's good enough as a starting point. And you have to take it away and practice. So something like Jataka stories, just as basic morality, teaching morality, they're really useful. Whether they're the actual word of the Buddha or not, we can't know because we're living now two and a half thousand years later. But if they accord with the general teachings of the Buddha, the principles in each Jataka story, talking about using different good qualities such as kindness, wisdom, mindfulness, patience, effort to solve problems, to solve suffering, to conquer the mental defilements in one way or another. You know, these these Jataka stories can be very useful just to inspire people, to arouse faith, energy, whether they, they're the exact word of the Buddha or not. We possibly will never know, but then maybe it doesn't matter if they're helpful in our practice, we can use them. And, and many things, you know, stories from around the world that are not from Buddhism, can still be useful ways to inspire you, give you some wisdom, some understanding. You know, I think we can keep our mind open to many things. And Jen Chao used to say, everything is teaching us. So, you know, you. You see two dogs fighting in the street, you know, oh, that looks awful. You're seeing the results of maybe greed if they're fighting over food or something. You say, oh, when people or dogs get very greedy, they fight and it leads to terrible outcome. That's not a jataka, it's not a tripitika, but it can be a dhamma lesson comes in. So in life, there are many lessons coming our way every day, whether we are open to those lessons. Again, if you practice mindfulness, meditation, you train yourself to reflect on things, you can learn lessons all the time from very natural things, or from the books, or from Jataka stories, or the Dhammapada. And the Dhamma, the Pariyati, is not simply to be believed in. You might start there, oh, I believe the word of the Buddha is true, okay? But it's to be put into practice. It has to be taken as a theoretical explanation of the way things are, the words on the page, or the words in a talk, but then you have to take them away and put them into practice until you know for yourself. So if there's a Jataka story that you find helpful to understand the point of Dhamma, the power of forgiveness, or the power of wise communication with your somebody who doesn't like you or your enemy. Whatever it may be, I'm just giving you examples here. Whatever the Dhamma teaching contained in those words, if it helps you, helps give you insight, well why not? Why not use it? And just keep an open mind whether it's the exact words of the Buddha or something that's similar to the words of the Buddha. I'm not sure that it matters too much. There are many words you, know, you can find even in non-Buddhist teachings that sound like Buddhism. People say this, they read some ancient Greek philosophy or something from another religion or just some common sense that someone says in, in the market or something. Uh, you know, they might just say something like one guy once told to me, told me about the, the harm of human greed he said, even a mouse knows the size of its own stomach. 
why does a greedy human not know the size of the answer? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just a saying, but it means re something, doesn't it? It can help you, doesn't it? Or yeah, greed overtakes you and then you eat too much or you take too much from other people. It's not Buddhism as such, but it can be useful. Um, so I keep that open mind. Um, and then both Jatikas and Dhammapada have many good sayings and if you find them helpful, monks love to remember and recite Dhammapada phrases like my teacher Ajahn Chah used to always have a few favorite phrases like Atahi Atano Nato, make yourself a refuge to yourself. You've got to learn to depend on yourself, rely on yourself through your own practice. You've got to know for yourself. You can't always be relying on a teacher. The teacher only shows you the way, but you have to practice. That's what the Buddha said, that's what Ajahn Chah said. So some of these phrases, very useful reminders. Or another one he'd use, Atano Jyoti Atana. Teach yourself, remind yourself. You can't always re rely on other people to remind you. As a monk, we have many, many rules and practices. And the Buddha said, well, for the first period you're ordained, it's understandable. You haven't yet learned and you don't know everything. But after a while, you've got to be start taking responsibility for yourself. So after a while, you should be knowing the rules that you're supposed to keep and train with. And you can't, you know, so you've been a monk for a few years, you can't then say, well, I, nobody ever told me the rule, I don't know the rule. You know, that's, it's up to you as a monk to learn the rules. So you have to depend on yourself. And similarly, as lay Buddhists, you don't have as many rules as us, but five precepts say, if you're telling people I'm a Buddhist, but you don't keep the five precepts, openly you don't keep the five precepts. You're open to other people criticizing you, saying, I thought you said you're a Buddhist, why are you drinking? <laughs> why are you uh, killing bugs? Why are you cheating on your taxes or something? The five precepts are what we define as a Buddhist. We take refuge in Buddha Dhamma Sangha and then we undertake the five precepts. And nobody will criticize you if sometimes you unmindfully don't keep a precept as long as you're re-establishing the precept once you realize you've made a mistake, you've done something unwholesome. But if you're blatantly <coughs> disregarding the five precepts, you're not following the Buddha's words, the Buddha's teachings. So things like this are, are important. You know, are you practicing what the Buddha <coughs> taught? And anything that helps you, reminders, you have, in the end, you know, in the beginning is from a teacher, from the books, from retreats, everything is helping to remind you. But in the end, you have to learn how to remind yourself. As your child used to say, whether you're on your own or you're with other people, you, practice, you make your practice even and the same. It's not like, oh, when no one's around, I'll do all these unskillful things. I'll be lazy, I'll be greedy, I'll be angry. You try to practice in all situations, all places, on your own with others, evenly the same. Long talk. How do we aspire when we pay respect to a Jedi? Question two. If you were given money and you set aside some to do charity or donation, I just read it again. If you were given money and you set aside some to do charity or donation, do I get more merit? Is it that the one who gives or the one who do it? <laughs> Thank you, Lompo. Um, well, we have titties. They're usually uh, built as a, a shrine, a monument to in tribe Buddha relics, all relics of an Arahant, an enlightened master. Relics are usually 
fragments of bone or body parts, occasionally from other parts of the body. So hair, teeth, nails. Recently, a few years ago, a famous monk who used to live in Adelaide, who was considered well practiced for Rumpo Punyarit. He passed away and they cremated him and his heart was left after the cremation. This huge uh, charred, obviously the heart was charred, it became blackened, but it was still there. Everything else disintegrated as, you, as it does with the cremation, but the heart was left. So not only the bones and the hair and the soft, very solid parts, even the heart can become a relic. So he kept that and put that in a chin for, uh, in honor of him. So it is something that the, even the Buddha said is appropriate to build a stupa, a chedi, to house relics. And it becomes a place of worship. You go, you can bow, you can meditate, you can chant, you can circumambulate with flowers, candles, and we do. The idea is it's, it's like a beacon or something that reminds you of enlightenment, reminds you of the path of practice, reminds you that human beings can practice. And maybe the Chedi to an Arahant, not just the Buddha. Men and women, we have in Thailand, we have enlightened nuns, and they have Chedis built for them as well. It's not a gender thing, it's not an age thing, it's not a race thing. You don't have to be living in a certain part of the world. Anyone who practices the Noble Eightfold Path can receive the results of that, or experience the results. And then, if the students of that person usually they become a teacher, don't they? Well, the students they see it's appropriate to build a chedi, to build one. And you go, like I go to Ajahn Chah's chedi in Thailand, which I helped to build as well. And I meditate there every time I go. I get peaceful very quickly. I remember Ajahn Chah and his teaching. So many good things come up very quickly when I'm there. I'm very happy that there's a chedi there. <laughs> There are some people who look in a more superficial way and say, oh, Buddhists are always building chedi, what a waste of money, a waste of time, you look in a <coughs> negative way. But you know, if you are a student of a teacher, you're willing to teach with enlightened, build a chedi, go there, you can constantly bring up your faith. People have good meditation and in Charles chedi, sometimes they hear celestial chanting, smell celestial flowers, and see devas and nagas there, all kinds of amazing things happen. I'm not saying that's the purpose of it, but it happens. Um, and it boosts your practice. So chedis can be very useful. But um, you know, people go and they do make different wish, have different wishes, aspirations. Some are more worldly, some are more short term, some are more long term. So like for me, I always make the aspiration to following my teacher to abandon all the defilements. Uh, whether it's this life or a future life, that's what I aspire to. And I just reinforce that aspiration over and over again. Uh, I once went to a chedi, Lung Ho Chuan, was considered to be an Arahant, the science of Ajahn Lung, and he had a chedi at his monastery in Sakonako with a group of monks and you know chedis often they have marble floor super clean and one cleans that's wiped down every day they really know you bow this or that so you bow and made our aspiration of, I aspired to Mother Palindana and as I said the monk next to me said if Lopo Juan was an Arahant may a relic of his manifest right in front of me. <laughs> why he thought that and there and then a little relic manifested on the floor right in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> so it can be even that uh, strange or amazing um, that some people have more worldly aspirations. I, I wouldn't really use a chedi as a, for a worldly aspiration. I would stick to, you know, Dhamma. So may I keep the five precepts for the rest of my life? May I keep eight precepts? May I practice? following the Buddha every life until I reach Nibbana. In whatever you, way you want to word it, I would, when you go to a chedi, you do that. You go up to this chedi and make that little aspiration. All the meditation I've done on this retreat, the Dhamma I've heard, the Dhamma I've practiced, may be a cause for my 
uh, realizing Maga uh, Nibbana. Chetis are good places to do that. It doesn't have to be an amazing, super expensive chen either. In our monastery, one month he made a little rock chen. Just put rocks together a couple of meters high, spent a few months just gathering rocks. We have a lot of rocks on a hill, put them together, and put some relics inside and made a a rock, simple rock chedi on the side of the hill. Chedi is really anything built just to uh, worship the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, worship, worship Nibbana, the enlightenment. What was the other part of the question now? Uh, about dana, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, the Buddha did encourage us to separate our funds, our earnings. If you get very little money, then you don't have to do this because you've got so little, maybe all you can do is earn and support yourself through the accommodation, support a family. Maybe you don't have much to uh, give away, and that's fine. And if you have more, more means, or maybe you separate some of your earnings that you feel appropriate to support the religion, support the poor, the sick, the needy, because there's always somebody who needs help do what you can. And that's a very wholesome intention. And as I said yesterday, it's helping you to let go of a lot of craving and attachments, needs, possessiveness. And really, you know, there's, we can always do more. You, know, you don't know how much you can do, what you can do, but you know you can always do more. So you look around for opportunities to, to give, to share, in whatever way you can. How should we contemplate on our body and food effectively to reduce the craving for sensual pleasure and not act out of the pressure that comes from these cravings? Are we psychologizing ourselves to see things rightly? Question 2. What is the wisdom we are looking after? Is it the wisdom that enables us to follow and practice the Noble Eightfold Path rightly. Thank you, Long Paul. One, one of the roles of precepts is to help train your external conduct, body, speech, give you limits, give you um, guidelines. So, Five precepts, eight precepts are the basis of that, but actually you can develop precepts a little bit further. So say you're on retreat, the rules of the retreat are your precepts as well. So like maybe it says you have to get up and come to the hall at 6 a.m. That becomes a precept for the retreat. So it's just a, a guideline, a rule that you undertake. You have that sense of commitment, sincere, so you come to the hall at 6 or when we take food, we have one dish and we line up and we let the person in front take theirs first and the one behind us will take after us and we take enough food for the rest of the day on our plate. That's a precept, isn't it? So an agreed way of doing things. And it, you, know, you could say it's a small precept, but it's, it's one. So like Ajahn Chah, in his monastery, he used to say, you know, if you are a bigger person or you eat more, okay, you can take a bit more than someone who's smaller or skinnier perhaps, but only take what you can eat. Greed is taking more than you, you need to keep healthy and happy. So, you know, that's what happens when you see a lot of nice food on the <laughs> table. You, your eyes go, oh, yeah, 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 and you, know, you forget how much. You're no longer a mouse, now you're a greedy human. You forget how big your stomach is. And you may take more than you really need. And you may end up wasting food, you've got too much there, you took it, thinking you might like it, but in the end you couldn't eat it. And that's what greed does. And so you can make rules for yourself about food, about sleep, about the use of various material things. But another rule we have on this retreat, you put your mobile phone away. Don't use it. And, you know, how much of our mobile phone is just sensual indulgence, so looking at pictures and adverts, all kinds of entertainments, etc. It's 
not absolutely essential. So you can make rules like this in your life to help you deal with your sensuality when you identify a particular issue, maybe a bad habit that you you, you see. Well, you say you make a rule for yourself. You know, I'm going to do this less, or I'm going to cut this out. You make some rule to reflect that. What we might call a resolution. Uh, you know, you when you make a rule or a resolution, you want to do it. Do something that's doable, possible. Don't be too idealistic and say, you know, I'm never going to eat again. <laughs> that's, that's impossible. But you know, I'm going to eat this amount of food or at this time, or these items. I like to quote uh, Jalpa Noor was a monk who uh, did child praise because he's very disciplined. Uh, he lived in Bangkok, but we believe he came an enlightened monk. One of his rules was he had the same food every day. He chose a balanced diet, you know, of carbohydrates, proteins, vitamins, you know, the way we do nowadays, we think it like that. He chose his diet and he told his lay supporters, just provide this for me every day. No need to deviate every day. No need to try this, try that. Oh, oh you're going to have this, oh, you're going to have that. <laughs> just the same food every day for the rest of his life. You can do that if you're disciplined enough, but it takes some practice, doesn't it? If that's too difficult, well, you cut out one food that you know is your weakness, your favorite type of food, favorite type of dessert, or whatever. Maybe something where you've noticed you indulge, you cut that out. Or you've just limited the amount you have, how often, how much. Same with everything, isn't it? Other kinds of sensuality. You know, we have eight precepts: celibacy, five precepts, one partner. So that's something that here probably you can keep. I hope, but out there, <laughs> maybe people have two or three partners. Jincha used to say, you, know, you, "You don't, you can't even fully know one person in your life. So if you have multiple people, your life gets more confusing, more problems." for yourself and for everyone else. There's all kinds of areas where we can manage our sexual desire, first with precepts and rules, and then obviously internally you start developing mindfulness and reflections that help, like impermanence. Whatever pleasure you get from the sensual realm is impermanent, it doesn't last. And that's part of the problem with addiction, is that you get this little bit of pleasure, the high, and it stops. You want it again, so you go after it again and again and again. But it won't last, and the pleasure diminishes over time. You get a little, some pleasure at first, and then second time less pleasure, third time even less pleasure, until maybe you're getting no pleasure at all. You're just uh, uh, taking that thing, consuming that thing, the product, food or whatever it is, just to stay normal because you become addicted. Let's say alcohol. If you drink alcohol every day at first, you get light, happy, it's good, enjoy yourself, but gradually you get accustomed to it, your nervous system, your body gets accustomed to it. So after a while you're drinking just to feel normal, you become addicted. And of course that does terrible things to your body. Cigarettes, drugs, all kinds of things that give us a sort of a hit, a pleasure, caffeine, gambling, you know, there's so many things. After a while, you just need to do it just to feel normal, just to cope with life. And that's a real problem for us. You've now created this burden for yourself and maybe other people. So reflect on the drawbacks, the dangers of sensuality, reflect on the impermanence of these pleasures, the short-term nature of happiness doesn't last very long. And look to the higher happiness, the happiness that comes from Dhamma, from keeping precepts, from meditating, practicing dharma, compassion, and ultimately training your mind in vipassana, insight, leads to the highest happiness, much more satisfying states of mind and understanding than just those sensual indulgence.
from home. To break through Sakaya Diti, we have to break through the perception of the body and feeling. Is this correct? Thank you, Hong Kong. <coughs> well, you could probably describe it as breakthrough. Um, establishing mindfulness and wisely reflecting on the craving and attachment that forms around the body, the feelings, the perceptions, the thoughts, what we call a human being. Buddha divided into the five candors, but we reduce it as body and mind. And it's this sense of this belongs to me, I am this, I am this body. Under the microscope of insight, when mindfulness is more continuous, you haven't got a lot of distraction, or the mental hindrances are not bothering you, you can look at this body and start to look at it with a sense of detachment and see this body is actually a collection of component parts, elements that are impermanent, doesn't last. It's definitely going to die. It's changing every day, aging every day. Until that understanding is just normal for you, you know you're going to die. You're not afraid of that, you're not surprised by that, shocked by that, whether it's yourself or other people, you just know everyone must die because the human body is impermanent and you, you can't control it. When you still have a delusion of self, you say, this body is mine, so you, you get ill, you run to the doctor, it's doctor, you've got to save me, doctor, you've got to fix me. That's the only outcome you've got in your mind, isn't it? No one goes to the doctor and says, if I die, I die, I stay alive, I die. <laughs> Maybe a monk might do that, but most people don't do that. You know, they only want one thing, save me. <laughs> because of the attachment, the identification with the body. But you know, what is the body? Question that. The hair of the head, nails, teeth, skin, blood, bones, all the parts of the body. Which part is really you? Which part can you say is me and control it? That's the practice of developing wisdom, understanding, frees you from attachment to the body, attachment to the view that this body is a self, a being, a person. Why is it when you cut your nails off, you cut your hair off, you go to the toilet, the waste, you have no more sense of belonging or ownership on the waste. You don't want it anywhere near you. You flash it away, you sweep it away. Just one minute before it was on your head, on your hand, in your body. One minute later it's gone. Where did, what happened? What changed? It's because when it was in you, you didn't see it's not self. If you look in the mirror, you're not going, hair is not self. You're going, oh, what does my hair look like today? I'm styling, wash it, whatever. We're constantly pampering, looking after the body, wanting it to be a certain way. Day one, until either we die or we develop some insight and realize that the body is only so, so good. So the mind inhabits the body, and then we do the same with feelings, thoughts, perceptions. Take everything as self, and that's why we suffer. The wisdom in Buddhism is saying these things are impermanent, not to be clung to as self, because they are not self. You can't control them, you can't make them do what you want. Doesn't mean to say you have to get rid of your body. Wisdom isn't that. Doesn't mean to say you have to get rid of thoughts, get rid of feelings. But you have to know they are conditioned things that are ultimately not so. They arise through causes and they pass away. Many teachers I know, they have sort of simple ways of describing this. They say someone who's let go of Sakaya Niti, they see the death in their body. I mean, they know their body will die one day. There's no doubt about that. No confusion, no kind of, please, can I stay a bit longer? <laughs> That's craving, isn't it? You know, the craving to last longer, to live longer. When the time comes, it doesn't mean you say you have to die. 
quickly or early, but when the time comes, you have to know this is the way it is. You have to die. You have to leave everything in this world. Nothing. You can't take anything with you. So as a way of practice, do this. Go through the list. What what is really mine in this world? Family, kids, money, property, friends. What do I really own? What can I take with me when I die? You can't. All has to be left behind. It's all impermanent, all not self. Doesn't mean to say there's nothing there, but what is there is not yours. <laughs> at first, nobody likes this kind of teaching at the book. That doesn't sound very good. I spent my whole life trying to accumulate wealth, build a family, look good, feel good, have fun. So it goes against the whole train of the world, or thinking in the world, but once you have some insight, you realize that it's actually the happiest thing in, in, in the whole world, out of this world, to realize you don't have to cling to anything yourself, you let it go, right? put your feet up, <laughs> let go, that's why we call it letting go, We're letting go of this grasping of everything yourself. I like the story of the Buddha sitting under the tree meditating and the farmer comes, he's lost his 16 cows, goes through the forest. Where are my cows? Because his whole livelihood is his cows. You know, in India, cows are everything. Your wealth, your livelihood, your future, your family, everything is invested in those cows. And he's lost them. He's lost them. He's coming, have you seen my cows? And the Buddha doesn't answer him. He just says, do you know I'm the happiest person in the world? <laughs> Imagine. Why are you answering me like that? And the Buddha says, I'm the happiest person in the world because I don't have 16 cows to worry about. <laughs> Just this simile, isn't it? Like, whatever it is you identify with as yours, whether that's your body, your feeling, your emotion, your thought, your possession, your friend, your family, it will bring you suffering if you attack. Simple as that. Wherever you attach, you suffer. So wisdom in Buddhism is seeing that, understanding that clearly, so then you let go. But it doesn't mean to say you give up on life. It just means you use the body while you have it to do good. Like a vehicle, a car, you can use a car to do good things, come to a retreat, go on off the dana, help your friend, go to work. You can use a car, you can use your body to do good things. But at the same time, you know, it's impermanent when they use let it come. You can use your thoughts to do good things. doesn't mean that you have to hate thought or get rid of thought. But you use thought as a useful tool to understand things, to know things, to help other people, to help yourself. But you also don't cling to your thoughts as self. So they're like a tool. You pick them up and use them. When you finish, you put them down again. Emotions, you know, even our hands will experience emotion, positive emotions, metta, karuna, they have pity and sukha, they feel happy. So it's not like our hands are kind of dead robot. No, they feel, but they don't attach to those emotions with self. When the time comes, they know they're just impermanent, they're not self. Dear Long Po, why does the Buddha wants us to keep eight precepts? Is it because the Buddha wants us to train our resilience? Thank you and Sadhu. Train what? Resilience. Oh, resilience. Yeah. Um, I understand you just written it that way. To be honest, I don't think the Buddha wants anything. <laughs> <laughs> the Buddha is happy. <laughs> Passion Buddha lays out the path of practice and says, look, if you want to be free from suffering, do this, giving you a way of practice. And he didn't even say you have to keep the eight precepts. Like, who do we hold up in Buddhism as the kind of leading lay practitioners in the time of the Buddha? The Saka and the Natapindaka. These two Buddhists have the five precepts normally. I would imagine they would also keep the eight precepts sometimes. Five precepts was their norm. 
and for many, many Buddhists, you start with the five precepts. That's hard enough, isn't it? It's hard to keep the five precepts well, purely. Just start there. Keep the five precepts. If you break them, you forget them, you come back to them, re-establish them over and over again until they're the norm for you. When I say the norm, I mean it just naturally you're thinking with the precepts in mind. You're mindful of your precepts every day. So you may be in a situation where you're tempted to kill. Well, you know, inviting. Everyone knows that. We've all had that here. <laughs> but you don't kill it. You go, hmm, it's annoying, it's painful, it's annoying, whatever. But you find another way to solve the problem. You shoo it away, or you go and put some repellent on, or you move away, whatever. You do something, but you don't kill. So after a while, the intention to kill doesn't even arise. The intention to steal doesn't even arise. Even if you meet someone and put their money there on the floor, they've forgotten it, they've walked away, you're not thinking, oh, I could have that, no one would know. Maybe you think, oh, who's is this? Can I help them? At the very least, you're not getting involved with it, you're not taking what is not yours. Your mind changes through the precepts. A lot of unskillful intention that you abandon the let go. And that's one good thing you see in a monastery. Uh, I live in a monastery. Over the years, you see people with some bad habits that come in and then they change. And they start changing. They abandon those intentions through the five precepts. Never underestimate the five precepts. They're like the gateway to Nibbana, the starting point. But as your faith increases, improve and you learn meditation maybe then you'll see maybe the value of eight precepts at least sometimes because eight precepts simplifies your life cuts out entertainments you sleep on a simple bed you don't eat in the evening imagine if you cut out your evening meal at least sometimes like when we're here it makes life so simple Imagine if all the volunteers were down there in the kitchen three times a day. It is a good day. The retreat would end up being just food. <laughs> Once a day is enough <laughs> on eight precepts. Sure, I argue you eat three times a day is fine, but eight precepts, they simplify your life, they give you time, energy, get a lot of energy when you're celibate. You don't have to chase after men and women. You don't have to <laughs> have sexual relations. All that energy is channeled into meditation. You feel good for that. So the eight precepts simplify your life, focus your energy on training the mind to abandon greed, anger, and delusion. So they're very suitable. But you don't have to keep them all the time. Try them on a retreat or even at home maybe once. For one day, just try keeping eight precepts. But if you can't do it, some people have health issues, or just find it difficult, okay, well, try the five precepts first. There's no absolute here. And if you're not keeping the eight precepts, it doesn't mean to say you're a bad Buddhist or something like that. It's not like that. These are means to an end, and they're supportive tools for the practice. And it's up to you whether you use them or not. No one's going to blame you or be, it's not like Buddha is up there standing you know, tapping his foot. Yeah. <laughs> she didn't keep your precepts. <laughs> <laughs> Blaming. It's not like that, is it? It's whether you're ready and you undertake them, you're ready, you voluntarily undertake them because they help you. Once you see the value, then you do it. Plus two. <laughs> Dear Ajahn, could you please elaborate the precept do not eat afternoon? How it came about and what are the allowables and why? <laughs> Thank you. Lord. It looks like this food thing is a big deal. <laughs> doubts about whether I could become a monk. And the first one was whether I could get up at 3 a.m. every day. The wake-up bell was 3 a.m. 
and I stayed there a few days. I realized I can do it. And I asked other monks, I said, yeah, you can do it, you get used to it. And getting up in the morning in Thailand, like Penang, it's cool, it's quiet. I realized you know, it's quite an advantage. You can make use of that early part of the day to meditate. So I quickly dismissed that now. The second day was, can I get by on one meal a day? One meal in the morning, no evening meal. And uh, again, I asked the other monks, I said, yeah, you get used to it. You can eat as much as you need at that one sitting. You feel a bit heavy afterwards, but gradually you digest it. And it makes life very simple, one meal a day. In the evening, you're not walking around looking for food or bothering people for food. And in those days, as far as allowables go, there was very little. <laughs> uh, a treat would be one little square of dark chocolate. Right. If I was at Wat Nana Chat, and there's a lot of Western monks there, so like my mum, like once every six months or something, she'd send you one family bar of Cambridge dark chocolate. That's one of the allowables, just dark chocolate, not milk chocolate, dark chocolate. But then if you've got ten monks and laymen, <laughs> everyone gets one square. <laughs> so you've got your one square, you sort of suck on it, and one minute later it's gone. <laughs> you have to wait another six months for this. <laughs> Bit like we used to joke, it's a bit like prisoners of war, <laughs> skinny, and every time a parcel comes, you sort of, oh, I wonder what it is. And sometimes it's tea or coffee, sometimes it's chocolate. So, very little in those days. On the uh, holy day, the full moon day, new moon day, the lay people would bring in these allowed with fruits, they're called Samoas, I think, translated from Mirabella and stuff. Um, they're like very hard plums, or I guess they call them, but they're very bitter, hard, <laughs> not very nice to eat. You get a laxative. And the, the lady would make a, a mixture of chili and sugar. You can dip the fruit in, you can chew them. And then if you're careless and eat too many, you spend the whole night in the toilet. <laughs> So sometimes the new monks were like looking for anything because there's nothing else to eat in the evening. We'd eat too many and just <laughs> ruin their meditation. So the first thing we had to learn was how to just you know have one or two just to help your digestion and go to the toilet, but don't indulge. We had very little in coffee. We didn't get coffee at Indian Charles Monastery. It was maybe once a week we get some kind of to drink in the evening, that was it. Nothing to eat, no chocolate, nothing. And you get a cup of tea or coffee with some sugar. And some of the monasteries I stayed in is so poor. Like, I remember one farmer's wife, she wanted to give the monks a treat. And like four months we were living together. And she bought a tiny little bag of sugar. And she was just saving so that and brought it in and offered it. And, you know, it only lasted for one drink for a few months. Some tea and sugar in it. That was very nice, but I just felt so sorry for her. Like she spent her savings to buy this bit of sugar because those people were very poor. It was like that. It was a very poor society, a very little extra other than the one meal a day. Of course, nowadays, fast forward 40 <laughs> years, <laughs> chocolate, prunes, cheese, all these many, many allowables. Monastery or each tradition will allow more or less. There's certain variations between teachers and traditions, but there's a lot more. And of course, food, there's a lot more food as well. When I was a young monk, I was very skinny, a lot skinnier than this. <laughs> Sometimes you even had a meal of plain rice. There wasn't anything else offered that day if you were walking and wandering. Much simpler times. Um, but we are allowed us certain things in the evening, and the reason we are allowed is because we don't eat, but we're allowed some juice, tea, coffee, or sugar, or honey. And the idea is just to give you energy to keep practicing in the evening when you may feel tired or hungry. But they're not supposed to be like 
of great nutritional value. It's not a meal, but just a, something small to keep you going. Um, the idea of the eight precepts or a retreat format like this, or living in a monastery, is you just get used to the simplicity of it, and you do. You get used to one meal a day, sometimes on a retreat, two meals a day. You get used to having very little in the evening. But once you are used to it, you actually prefer it. I, I would prefer this. I wouldn't want to go back to eating in the evening because the amount of time you spend on food preparation, cooking, eating, and then washing up, that's another period of time where you've lost time to meditate, to study the Dhamma, and get involved with eating. So I, I find that in precepts very conducive to practice. I don't know if you know the origin story why monks aren't allowed to eat in the evening. Because the Buddha made that rule after one month. And the original monks didn't have a rule that they couldn't eat in the evening. So sometimes they, in the afternoon they'd be wandering around with a bowl to collect food. And sometimes even in the evening at night when it's dark, a monk would be hungry, I guess, He'd be going out with his arms bowl. And one monk stopped at a house, he went around the back to the kitchen, hoping to get some food in the evening. And the lady of the house came out, and she saw the monk, she thought he was a ghost. <laughs> she screamed, and, what are you doing, what are you doing? And there's a ghost here, there's a ghost here. And she panicked, and the word got to the Buddha, they said, well, we can't have this. It's going around town at night, scaring people, making them think they're ghosts. So he said, you can only eat in the morning, you can only go on trap. Morning. It seems logical, doesn't it? If you eat in the morning, then the rest of the day you've got free time and you can use the energy from the meal, if it is a big meal, you use it up through the day and in the evening your stomach feels light and that's really helpful for meditation. Um, when is the hardest time to meditate? Straight after a big meal. <laughs> so if you're not eating the evening, you, you stay light, it's very conducive to the practice of meditation. Is that the last question? Yes, this is the kicker. Dear Longpo, what's the ultimate way to prepare for a good death? And eventually a good river or better skin river. Thank you, Longpo. And what you're doing. I think you know you are preparing for a good death here. To do more retreats, do more meditation, listen to more Dhamma, keep more dana. Offering dana is a very good preparation for death. Why? It's going to give you a lot of good memories. It also helps to, you to let go of some attachment as you're going through life. Accumulating wealth, but then you're giving it away. So you're seeing that process of letting go, of giving up ownership. But you also develop a lot of happiness. You can help people doing different dana projects, charity, helping family, friends, and helping meditation centers, monasteries, sangha. There's so many things we can do with dana, and it will give you many good memories that later you can come back to. You ask people who are, say, Buddhists who are close to the end of their life, what brings you joy? Well, one thing that brings them joy is remembering the dana that they've given. Food, requisites, donations, help in all forms. Brings people a lot of joy over and over again. It's not just once. You can remember the dana you've given over and over again. It will bring you happiness. Sometimes you don't even have to consciously remember the dharma you've given, it pops up anyway. For someone with a clear mind and they've done a lot of dharma, it'll just constantly pop up and make them feel happy. Same with precepts. You train in keeping the five precepts or even the eight precepts for a month, the Padimokha rules, this comes up in your mind over and over again and it's a source of happiness right to the end of your death, to the end of your life. So dana, sila, and then bhavana. Learn to meditate now like you are. Learn to practice mindfulness. Cultivate effort. Abandon unwholesome thoughts regularly through your life. 
change the way you think for the better, develop wisdom and understanding, understanding of the Four Noble Truths, abandon the craving, the attachment, cultivate the path, develop states of Samadhi. So if you really want a good death, develop some Samadhi, like you're doing here. And I know people who have developed Samadhi through their life, and then at the time of death, they keep their mind very calm. Quite naturally, they can keep their object at the end of their life because they've done it before. Assuming they're conscious, obviously it's not everyone dies. In a conscious state, sometimes people die in their sleep, sometimes they're unconscious before death. But if they're conscious, they can use samadhi to stabilize their mind, keep it in a skillful state, let go of worries and regrets. So develop some samadhi. And then best of all, develop some wisdom, insight. Before your body dies, know that your body is going to die. So you're not shocked by that. You're not surprised by, oh yeah, this body will die. I'm not going to be here forever. This body will definitely get old, get sick, and die. When? I don't know, but I do know it will die. It doesn't surprise me. You know, if you're a bit cheeky, when death comes, you just say, ah, oh, I was waiting for that. <laughs> It's going to happen. It's inevitable. Is there anyone here who is not going to die? No. So be ready for it. Isn't it? Partly it's just a mental preparation, isn't it? That's why we have the chance. It's one of these recollections. Five dhammas for frequent recollection, daily recollection. I'm of the nature to age, I'm of the nature to sicken, I'm of the nature to die. I'll separate from everything I love in life for sure. And I'm the owner of my karma to receive the results of my karma. Five recollections that will free you from all regrets, worries, sadness, confusion. If nothing else, develop those five recollections every day. Just do that charm once a day. And that will make you a very wise person. And I've met people who've done that. People who've been sick either through just old age, cancer or some other illness and they're getting to the end of their life every week but they practice this Dhamma, they practice the Dhamma, the Sina, the Bhavana and it comes up over and over again to keep their mind happy, peaceful, so they don't have much fear of death. And I often tell the story of my mum used to have a friend who at first used to go to Amravati Buddhist monastery, where of course Samedo lived, but he started that monastery. My mum used to live near there, and they would go and do meditation retreats and workshops there. Then the friend got cancer and was hospitalized, so she was very sad she couldn't go to the monastery anymore, but she carried on meditating in hospital. A very wise person, she understood you can't. Um, stop a very serious illness and the doctors did their best but they couldn't treat her or couldn't stop the cancer spreading so she accepted it she didn't stress about it get worried about it she just accepted it and she said i've lived a good life i can remember doing many good things that makes me happy and life has value so she had a really skillful attitude my mum and four friends would drive to see her. My mum was already like 80 years old. All these people in their 80s would drive to the hospital to see their friend who died of cancer. And the friend would be sitting there, skinny, weak, so very peaceful, very serene. And my mum and her four friends were all going to give her, they say, to cheer her up, <laughs> to give her support, as you would do. But they get, went there with this idea, we're going to help this person who's dying. And the person who was dying was a meditator and very wise, and they're just sitting there very peaceful. And everyone would be talking to their friend who's dying and telling them about the problems in their life. And <laughs> <laughs> the one sitting dying of cancer on the bed had no problems. They go, oh yeah, oh yeah. You've got problems with the kids with the husband, problem with this, problem with that. And then it dawned on everyone who went to visit the lady that oh, 
She never complains. She doesn't have any problems. She's always so peaceful and so kind and listens to us. We're the one who's benefiting from this hospital business. <laughs> the, the patient is actually teaching us. And they all realized that. So they were very grateful to be able to visit this wise, peaceful lady before she died because she taught them how to die well. Anyone can achieve that if you just use the Dhamma in your life, keep your mind peaceful, let go of the anger, the worries, meditate, listen to Dhamma, do some dana, develop some joy, happiness with family, friends, and even with strangers, and you can die well. We can all do that. No one sitting here can't do that. You can all do that. Just keep going. Don't do one retreat and then forget all of that. <laughs> <laughs> Too many people do that as well. You have to keep going. Keep going through your life. You may not be able to do a retreat later on, but you can still meditate, listen to Dhamma. Many people I know have listened to Dhamma on their deathbed. They were lying there at home or in hospital and they listen to Dhamma every day, listen to chanting, and it uplifts them. The whole point of the Dharma practice is to uplift you, bring your mind up, make you happier, more peaceful. When we forget the Dharma, your mind goes down, doesn't it? Think of all the worst things, the bad things, the regrets, the anguish, depression, everything's wrong, this is not right, that's not right. So, the most senior monk in Thailand, who's now 96, uh, he's well, not the most senior in, in terms of years, but in terms of position, it's called the Sangha Raja. It's like the Thai Buddhist Pope, similar. He gave this talk a while ago and he said, when you get old, don't be one of those grumpy old people <laughs> who's ill and got all kinds of aches and pains and nobody really wants to visit. <laughs> Let go, relax, and be a blessing to your family, to your kids, your grandkids, your friends, whoever it may be. Be a blessing. Don't just be a grumpy old person complaining all the time. You have to practice that. You have to do that through your practice. So I, that's maybe my, we're finishing now for this, this period. So my last wish for you on this session is that may you not become a grumpy old person. <laughs>